put up the furnace diagram. So just get you started before they guys get started. Uh, give you a quick introduction to how glass blowing works. Everything that we do starts out in our glass furnaces. The glass furnaces are the machines where you see the doors closed. There's two of them, one on each side. If you look up on the big screen, you'll see a diagram. No, on the screen, not at the ceiling. <laughs> That's what the furnaces look like inside. So each one of them has a big ceramic pot. In that ceramic pot is a thousand pounds of melted glass. <coughs> you keep the melted glass at 2140 degrees. At that temperature, the glass has the consistency of honey. So it's like a big giant crock pot full of honey. We want to get the glass out to make stuff. We take one of these steel pipes that you will see shortly, and we dip it into the molten glass like you dip it into a big jar of honey. We dip it in, twirl it around. A little bit of glass sticks to the end of the pipe. The pipe is hollow, so when you blow, the ball of glass blows up like a balloon. If you want to make something larger, you dip it in, blow a little bubble, let it harden. Then you dip it in a second time or a third time. You just keep building up the glass in layers. Once we get the glass out of the furnace, it only stays soft for a little while. So we do whatever shaping or blowing we can while it's still hot and soft. And then we go to the second type of furnace, and that's called the glory hole. Those are the round ones with the doors open. Those have no glass in them. They're just a hot chamber for heating and softening the glass while we're working. If you think of the glass like wax, you know when you get wax hot, it gets soft, but fairly quickly it gets stiff again. Glass is the same way. So we heat it up, it gets soft, we do a little shaping, it starts to get stiff, we go to the glory hole and warm it up again. And that's basically it. That's glass blowing. We can all go home now. So the man in the black shirt and jeans and the woman in the black shirt and jeans, those are our guest artists. That's Adam Holtzinger and Susan Sp Spironovich. Everybody else you see on the floor is our Museum of Glass Hot Shop team.
you guys have any questions? For those who just came in, we have two guest artists today, Susan Spir Spiranovich and Adam Holtzinger. They're glass blowers from New York. They have a company called Keep Brooklyn, where they do uh, specialty glass fabrication. They make a lot of lighting, and uh, they're here this week working with our team, and they're going to be trying out a huge variety of designs. So we're just getting started here. So, the first piece we're going to make this morning is going to be this guy over here. What? So, over to the right, Gabe, the man in the hat, is starting the first piece. The steel pipe in his hand is called the blowpipe. He dips it into the molten glass. A little bit of the molten glass sticks to the end. He's going to shape it up a little. And then we'll start to blow. Right now, he's picking out bubbles. He sees something in the glass that he doesn't want. While it's still thick and gooey, we can yank that stuff out and snip it off. And then we'll just round that mass out again and continue. have sort of two things going on at once here. We're going to be on this bench over here. We're going to be making a, hand, a little pre-made handles 
for the pieces that we're going to make later. And in the center bench, we're going to be making the bowl drawn over here. All glass, when it's really hot, looks orange. The orange color that you're seeing is the glow from the heat, not the color of the glass. If you look, if you have an electric stove in your house, when you, the burners are gray, when you turn them on to cook something, they get hot, they glow orange for a little while, turn them off, they cool down, they return to their natural color. Glass is the same way. When it's very hot, no matter what color it is, it's going to glow orange. As it cools down, you'll see more of the natural color. I think everything that we're going to make today will be clear. Does anybody have any questions so far? Yeah. Don't need them. You don't need them. If they become if we're making something that's really hot and they become uncomfortable, then they'll put a glove on. If they're comfortable, it's fine. The steel pipes, all the Common sense would lead you to believe that they're really hot, but they're not. He swings the glass like that. He's trying to make the bubble longer. Drop the bubble onto another steel pipe, cut it off, and we're going to use that bubble to make the foot. The foot is this little base that you see here. Well, uh, we buy colored glass separately in the form of these bars. We buy it like an artist buys paint. We blow a bubble of clear glass from the big furnace. We heat up a little chunk of that bar, and then we coat the bubble with whatever colored glass we want it to be. We're not going to do that today at all. going to bust off the little pointy part of that bubble. Do 
give it a little tap. That leaves us with a little hollow sphere with a hole in the end. We'll spread that out, and that will be the base of our vase. going to take a tool called the jacks and widen that opening a little bit. Now he's taking the shears and trimming off some of the thick glass. As Adam, man at the bench, widens the opening. Gabe, the man standing up, is holding a wooden paddle across the front. Make sure that's nice and flat. So that'll sit nicely on the table. Over on the right, you can see Ben, tall guy. He's stretching out the glass for the handle.
Next thing we're going to do in the center is we're going to transfer the base of the vase that Adam, the man at the center, has to a second steel rod called the punty. Gabe with the black hat, he's got the punty. His pipe is going to act as a temporary handle to hold the base while we work on the opposite side. So just stick it on there temporarily, and then we'll break it off the pipe that it's on. Drip a little water where we want it to break, give it a tap, and off it comes. As we make these little U-shaped handles, we're taking them over to that silver oven with the curved side. That's called the garage. That's where we park stuff until we're ready to use it. It operates at half the temperature of the furnaces. It's hot enough to keep the glass from breaking, but it's not hot enough to make it soft. So whatever goes in there stays warm, holds its shape. When we're ready to use it, we'll pull it out and heat it up a little extra. So as we make little parts for these, they'll go into the garage, they'll stay warm, we're ready to assemble the whole thing, we'll pull them out and stick them together. So we're going to take that base and we're going to stick it in the garage and that'll keep it warm until we're ready to assemble it. Does anybody have any questions? Questions are free. We're making this design over here. So Adam with the blonde hair to the right to the right of center. He's gonna go into the furnace and get some glass out. The steel pipe in his hand is called the blowpipe.
over on the far right. They're pre-making some handles that we're going to put on a piece we'll make a little later this morning. So we need a bunch of these handles. So our team is going to pre-make them. We'll put them in the garage, and then when we make the next piece, we'll pull them out and stick them on. In the center, Adam is shaping the glass using a tool called the block. The tool is made out of wood. It's stored in a bucket of water. As long as the wood is wet, the tool doesn't burn, and it doesn't leave any marks as he shapes the glass. There's going to be two parts to this phase. There'll be the base, which we just made, is a little, little hemisphere, and then the cone, which sits on top. And Adam is making the bubble for the cone. Just to help you identify who's who, the man, tall guy on the far right, that's Ben Cobb. He's the head of our glass shop here at the museum. The woman speaking to him is Sarah Gilbert. She's another member of our glass blowing team. And the man with the hat is Gabe Feenan. He's another member of our resident team of glass blowers. Adam and Susan are our guest artists, so they are only here for five days. We're making their designs, and they're being assisted by our resident team of glass blowers.
So you notice that one of the glass blowers is seated to the left of the workbench. He's the guy that's blowing. He's blowing into that steel tube, the blowpipe, and inflating the glass as Adam sitting at the bench shakes. Sarah is taking one of the handles over to the garage where it'll be kept warm until we're ready to assemble the pi that piece. So those handles are not going on this one that we're making now, but they'll go on a piece that we'll be making later in the day. They're making this, this piece on the end. See, that's uh, this bubble is the cone, that cone-shaped piece. We made the base already. It's sitting in the garage. And we'll join the two together. There's two ways in which we heat up the glass while we're working. One, we put it in the big round ovens, the glory hole. That kind of heats it up more generally. We also use torches. When we use the torches, we can focus the heat in a particular place. I think we're... Uh, Getting ready to attach the base. Gabe in the black hat on your left is warming up the base. He's holding it closer to the flame so it gets a little hotter. Periodically, you'll notice Adam in the center takes out a pair of calipers so we can maintain, check the sizes so we can maintain the proportions.
And Gabe has pulled out the base or the foot. We're going to warm that up a little extra before we attach the two sections. Hot glass sticks to hot glass. So we're going to heat up the bottom of the cone. We're going to heat up the top of the base. And when we press them together, they'll fuse. Get both parts hot. And when we press them together, they'll stick to each other. Anybody got any questions? An hour. What temperature? The glory holes run. Can we put up how hot is it? The glory holes run at about 2,300 degrees. The furnaces run at about 1140. That's Fahrenheit. We need the centigrade. We have the centigrade up on the big screen. Now we're going to transfer the vase from the rod it's on now, the blowpipe, to a second steel rod called the punty, P-U-N-T-Y. Once again, the punty will act as a temporary handle to hold it from the bottom while we shape the top. Gabe's going to come over with the punty. We'll bring it to Adam sitting at the workbench. Adam will attach it. When he feels that bond is strong enough, we'll drip a little water where we want the glass to break. We give the pipe a tap, and off it will come. So now the vase is held from the bottom. The top is exposed. The top can now be heated and shaped.
Do you guys have any questions? We're going to blow some air into the front end of that to puff out the tapered top. The tool that Gabe will be using is called the Sofietta. It's a metal cone with a tube going down the middle. And it allows us to inflate the glass even after we've removed it from the blowpipe. Now Gabe is blowing. You can see the shape inflating. Blow a little more air into that shape, make it fuller.
next thing we're going to do in the center is add some of these decorative bits. You call them these little fancy handles. Gabe in the black hat will get the glass out of the furnace. He'll bring it to Adam at the center bench. We'll start to construct these fancy handles. Natural gas. The colors of glass come mostly from metals dissolved in the glass when you first cook it up. Cobalt makes it blue, chromium makes it green, tin makes it white. Gabe holds the glass straight up and down. We'll draw some off the end. We'll attach it. Then we'll give it a little twist. We call this a walking bit. It's a classic. Venetian style handle. We're going to add another layer of these walking bits to each of the handles. Gabe gets the molten glass out of the furnace, hold it straight up and down, drip it off till it becomes like a thin stream. it on and then give it a twist, a twist, a twist.
repeat that same design on the opposite side.
So we're almost done. Everything that we make has to be cooled slowly or it'll break. So we're going to take it off the metal rod. We're going to place it in an electric oven called the annealer where it'll be cooled very slowly overnight. Over on the right, you see Gabe putting on some protective clothing. He's going to carry the finished piece to our annealing oven.
slow, but I'm getting better. What? Yep. There you go. I need a good story. Saving a puppy from an oncoming car. So, if you just came in, we have two guest artists today, Adam Holtzinger and Susan Spironovich. Adam is the blonde guy in the center of the shop. Susan is the woman in the black shirt and black pants standing next to the, the front bench. They are glass blowers. They have a custom shop for making custom lighting in New York. It's called Keep Brooklyn. Can we put up some of their lighting fixtures up on the big screen? So they do a lot of work like this. They make fancy lighting for fancy people. We're trying out some experimental designs today. You can see on the pedestals some of the things they've made while they've been here. So it's all over the map, trying out new ideas and uh, different processes. Hi, how are you guys? Good. Do you guys have any questions? A sort of, it's going to be more like her drawing over there. So it's going to be a bowl with a hemispherical foot, and then it's going to have a, a handle like you have a handle on a basket, only it's going to be angular, it's not going to be round. So this bubble that they're making here is going to become the basket part. I mean, it's going to become the bowl part. Do 
So just to get you guys started, uh, give me just a very brief introduction to how glass blowing works. Everything that we do starts out in our glass furnaces. The glass furnaces are the machines where you see the doors closed. There's two of them, one on each side of the studio. If you look up on the big screen, you'll see a diagram. That's what they look like inside. So inside each one of them is a big ceramic pot. In that ceramic pot is a thousand pounds of melted glass. You keep the melted glass at 2140 degrees. At that temperature, the glass has the consistency of honey. 2140 is about as hot as the hottest volcano. So it's like having your own little private volcano. We want to get the glass out of the furnace. We take one of those steel pipes. Those are called blow pipes. And we dip it into the melted glass like you're dipping into a big jar of honey. We dip it in, twirl it around. A little bit of glass sticks to the end of the pipe. The pipe itself is hollow. So when you blow, the ball of glass blows up like a balloon. So he just dipped into our furnace. That's Adam with the blonde hair. And that's the molten glass on the end of that pipe. Every once in a while, when we get the glass out of the furnace, it makes the steel pipes hot. When they're hot, we go over to that trough. It's called the pipe cooler. We spray water on the metal pipe. That cools it down and makes it easier to hold. So at this point, while the glass is thick and gooey, if he sees a bubble or some kind of impurity that he doesn't want, we can just cut it out. When the glass is hot, you can cut it with the scissors. Don't try that at home. So when we get the glass out of the furnace, it only stays soft for a little while. So we do whatever shaping we can while it's hot and soft. When it starts to cool and get stiff, we go to the second type of furnace, and that's called the glory hole. The glory hole is the round guy with the doors open. There's no glass in that one. It's just a hot chamber for heating and softening the glass while we're working. So you'll see Adam go to the glory hole. He'll hold it in there for a while, make it nice and soft, and they'll go back to the workbench and do some more shape. The tool in his hand that he's shaping the glass with is called the block. It's made out of wood. It's stored in a bucket of water. As long as the wood is wet, the tool doesn't burn, and it doesn't leave any marks as he shapes the glass. Do you guys have any questions? He's going to heat that up, make it nice and soft. And then we're going to start to blow it up to its full size and shape. You notice that one of the glass blowers is seated to the left of the workbench. That's Gabe. He's the guy that's going to be blowing. He's going to blow through that steel tube and inflate the glass as Adam sitting at the bench shapes it. dark gray pad in Adam's hand that he's shaping the glass with is just folded up ordinary newspaper soaked in water. As long as the newspaper is wet, 
It doesn't burn too much. And it doesn't leave any marks as he shapes the glass. Now he's going to squeeze the glass and make a nice sharp notch in it. That notch is the place where he's going to be able to break the glass away from the metal pipe once he's done shaping. You can see now Gabe is blowing. And you see the thing getting bigger. It's pretty much like blowing up a balloon. Checking the size. That's a torch, and we use it when we want to focus the heat in a particular place. When we put it in the big round oven, it kind of heats it up more generally. We need to focus the heat here or here or here. We use the torch. So we're going to add a little post on the bottom of our bowl. We'll just let that glass drip on. And then Adam will sit down at the bench and shape it. guys know about our contest for kids? Any kid 12 and under who comes to the museum can do a drawing. Once a month, we pick one of the drawings and we make whatever the kid drew out of glass. We make two copies, one for you to keep and one for the museum collection. It's free to enter. There's a table out in the lobby with drawing materials and entry forms. So any of you guys who are younger than 12, I can't really tell your ages. Some of you look older. What are you? How old are you? 15. Yeah, no, forget you. Go home. No. He's, a, he's not 12 yet. 
we put up some of the kids' design st stills? So if we look up on the big screen, these are some of the things that we've made from the kids' drawings. So you see there, that little girl is holding up her drawing, and below her are the glass pieces we made from her drawing. You can see the drawing and then the glass piece we made from it. So if you if you want to enter, there's a table in the lobby where you can do your drawing. If you don't feel like drawing right now, you can grab one of the entry forms, do the drawing at home and mail it in. So we're going to add another bubble to this to make the foot or the base. guys have any questions? So we're going to heat up the bubble that we just added to make it soft. We're going to give it a squeeze in the middle. We're going to bust off the pointy end of that bubble. So that leaves a little hole on the end. We're going to spread that out, and that will become the base of our bowl. So Adam's going to take a tool called the jacks and widen that opening a little bit. Trim some of the glass off where it's thick. And as he presses against the inside of that opening, that makes it wider. Uh, yeah, kind of similar. So it's going to be kind of a bowl with a basket handle, except the handle is going to be kind of angular instead of 
Uh, the color in the glass comes from different metals dissolved in the glass when you first cook it up. Cobalt makes it blue, chromium makes it green, a little bit of gold makes it red. So you got it, it's like making a chocolate cake. You get all the ingredients together and you bake them. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to transfer the bowl and the base from the rod it's on now, the blowpipe, to a second steel rod called the punty. The punty will grab it from the bottom so we can shape the top. The top of it is now attached to the metal pipe. We can't really shape it. So we'll grab it from the bottom, break it off, and then the top will be exposed and that can be heated and shaped. Sarah, over on the right, she's making the punty, the second steel rod. She's coated the end of that steel rod with a little bit of molten glass to make it sticky. So here comes Sarah with the punty. We'll stick it on the bottom. When they feel that bond is strong enough, we'll break the glass away from the first pipe. So Adam, in the center, will take those tweezers, dip them in water, drip a little water where he wants it to break. The water will crack the glass, give the pipe a tap, and off it comes. Yay. Magic. So now the top of the bowl is exposed. Now that part can be heated and shaped. Does anybody have any questions? The colors in glass come mostly from metals dissolved in the glass when you first cook it up. Cobalt makes it blue, chromium makes it green, manganese makes it purple. Not everything that colors glass is a metal, but most of the colorants are.
Uh, it could be beach sand. Glass has three main components, sand, soda ash, and lime. Sand is the bulk of it. It's mostly melted sand. Soda ash is sodium carbonate. It's a chemical which lowers the melting temperature of the sand. And the lime is calcium carbonate, and that stabilizes the mixture chemically. You throw those three ingredients in the furnace, cook them overnight. In the morning, you have a tank full of clear glass. Any sand anywhere will make glass. The whiter the sand is, the clearer the glass will be. But you could go to your, regular, your local beach, take a shovel, and we can make glass out of that sand. Black sand makes just a very slight grayish tint. It doesn't have enough uh, trace chemicals in it to really color the glass. I have friends who've gone to like volcanic beaches and try to make glass with it. And I mean, you can make glass with it, but it's rather unspectacular. If you really want it colored, you have to add the metals to get a good strong color. Yes, exactly. Cadmium produces yellows, um, chromium green. Yes, so we, they'll do it a combination with selenium. You can make the reds and oranges with uh, cadmium and selenium. Not quite as straightforward as paint. Yeah, that would be more Chemistry. Yeah. So if you cook up the glass with copper, if you cook it one way, it turns turquoise blue. If you cook it a different way, it turns blood red.
So now he's going to open the bowl, make it wider. The big tongs in his hand are called the parchofi, P-A-R-C-I-O-F-F-I. They're very similar to the jacks. The difference is the blades of the parchofi are made out of wood. The jacks are made out of metal. And when we use the parchofi, it's softer. It doesn't mark the glass as much. And we use it for kind of round, smooth shapes. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. What are, which ovens, the black ones or the silver one with the curved side? That's called the garage. That's where we keep stuff warm until we're ready to use it. It operates at half the temperature of the furnaces. It's hot enough to keep the glass from breaking, but it's not hot enough to make it soft. So if we make it something that has several parts, we make part number one, put it in the garage, part number two, put it in the garage, and then we're ready to assemble it. We pull them out one by one, heat them up a little extra, and stick them together. The big black oven on each end of the studio are called annealers. They are for cooling the glass down slowly once we're done. We keep them at a constant temperature all day long. We place everything we make during the day in there. And then at night, it has a little computerized thermostat that slowly turns the temperature down to room temperature. Those are called annealers. And the slow cooling process is called annealing. Oh, no, no. Is it, do we ever change our minds in the middle? Yes, all the time. Yeah, some things you can fix, some things you have to go start over. Yes. Does it ever fall in the glory hole? Sometimes, not very often, every once in a great while. It's not a big tragedy, we just pull it out. No, usually if it falls in the glory hole, it's dead. We have to start over. We mess up just like anybody else. Hopefully after a year, we don't mess up too often. This handle that we're going to put on this bowl, this is an experiment. So you might actually see us mess up right now. But we've never done this before. So we're trying it out for the first time.
as you can see, it's a glass shop tradition to work out our designs on the floor of the hot shop in chalk. get it off the pipe. We'll take a pair of tweezers, we'll dip them in water, we'll drip a little water on the joint between the bowl and the steel rod. The water will crack that joint and just a light tap and off it'll come. So Adam, with the blonde hair, to the right of center. He's getting a little more glass out of the furnace. And the glass that he's got there, this is what we're going to use to make the handle. When we go into the big furnace, it sometimes gets the steel pipe hot. We take it over to that trough. That's called the pipe cooler. We spray water on the metal pipe. That cools it down and makes it easier to hold. The hot bit, we'll cut it off, and can take tweezers, put the cold ring over that, and then pull the bit over. Also, maybe that's an instrument. You mentioned the walk into a handle. Yeah. Like that. You get the glass, you get the glass hot. A little marginal. Hold it straight up and down. It just drips off. So it gives it like a sheen. It touches the sheen. And then touches it down. And they're hoping it's real super hot. So that when they stick it on, they can put the walk in hand on it, but it's marginal so that it just makes a lot. So we're stretching out the glass for the handle. They have to be pretty long.
and attach it to our ball. We're going to heat it up a little extra, and then we're going to make the angle. wants it to be straight on top. As we do the magic with the handle, we have to warm up the foot and the connection between the metal rod and the glass. If we allow that to get too cold, that can crack. So when you're working on fancy stuff, you have to remember to keep that connection warm or it'll crack. When we use the torches, we can focus the heat just exactly where we want it. So he wants to shape that handle a little more so we can make the handle extra hot and soft without distorting the bowl beneath. So you notice that on each end of the handle, there's a kind of little gnarly nub, and we're going to cut those off. Once again, the torches will come in handy because we can just 
heat that up just exactly where we want to cut it. The torches in glass blowing, this kind of glass blowing is relatively new. It started in the 1950s. Just going to get the glass hot just where he wants to cut off those ends. Does anybody have any questions? Do you guys have any questions? We're just going to cut that off. is the glass that comes off. We can recycle our clear waste. We can't recycle our colored waste because the big furnace where we melt it is all clear. So we'll collect all our clear waste glass, bust it up, and then they'll go in the next time we cook glass.
put uh, the walking bits on the side. Watch how you got it. Now we're going to add this kind of little wiggly decoration called a walking bit. Sarah's getting glass out of the furnace. Stretch it out and take the tweezers, give it a twist, a twist, a twist. Do the same thing on the opposite side. So we're almost done. Everything that we do has to be cooled slowly or it'll break. So we're going to take the glass off the metal rod. We're going to place it in an oven called the annealer where it'll be cooled slowly overnight. We keep the annealer at, eight, at 920 degrees all day long. We place all the objects we make during the day in there. And the oven has a little computerized thermostat that slowly turns the temperature down and we cool off overnight.
So Sarah to the right has put on some protective clothing. The yellow gloves that she has are made out of Kevlar. Kevlar is a fire resistant insulating material. And she's going to grab the finished bowl and carry it to the annealer. In order to get it off, we're going to drip a little water on the joint between the bowl and the punty, the metal rod. The water will crack that joint and just a light tap will release it. Take his tweezers, dip them in water, put a few drops of water on that joint. Give the pipe just a gentle tap. Off it comes and into our annealing oven to cool slowly overnight. Let's have another hand for Adam Holtzinger, Susan Spiranovich, and our Museum of Glass Hot Shop team. Ben Cobb, Sarah Gilbert, and Gabe Feeney. Anybody got any questions? That was the first time we've ever made those handles, so. Glad we didn't embarrass ourselves.
So we're going to make some feet, the bases. A lot of these have these hemispherical bases. So we have a short time before lunch. So we're just going to make some feet. Over on the far right, Gabe is making a bubble for the foot. The little kind of hemispherical bases, we call them feet.
I'm going to bust off that little ant. No, just I like the barns because at least they're transparent. Yeah, that's so they right. know that they're glass.
Look what she did. We're fine. We have, I've had a toddler. I have a toddler. Uh, she brings them along. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Yay. It's better than nothing. We're live streaming. I'm gonna let people just lose your track. You people are still checked in. And that's live stream shows the audience. Yeah, yeah. And because a lot of people get in the summer at work and listen. Okay. Ooh, yeah. I don't know how to do it. Sure. I like a dim light. Moody. Wonderful. Yeah, it, the closed caption works great, as you can all see. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Katie Buckingham. I'm our curator here at Museum of Glass. And I am honored to be standing here with our visiting artists this week, Susan Spranovich and Adam Holtzinger of Keep Brooklyn. Uh, Susan and Adam are founders of Keep, a Brooklyn-based light company that is dedicated to maintaining the craft of glass blowing utilizing traditional Italian techniques to create contemporary work and signature patterning. They pride themselves on continuing small team-based glassmaking crews, uh, just like the old world Italian masters while creating objects with a modern flair. Uh, this is their first time joining us here for a residency at the museum, and they are part of a really special collaboration that we have with Pilchuck Glass School, uh, an international glassmaking school that was founded by Dale Chihulian is up north in Stanwood, about two hours north of here. Um, we invite select instructors and artists and residents from Pilchuck to continue the work that they do during a very busy teaching session here on the hot shop floor. And what we love about it is what inevitably results is a week of experimenting, pushing new ideas. Uh, and it's been really fun. Susan and Adam have certainly been stretching the boundary of what they do individually and together. So I'm um, so honored to have you guys here and excited to hear about your work and what you've been up to this week. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I'm Adam. I'm Susan. <laughs> Can you hear me OK? Is that better? All right. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thanks for joining us. Um, first, we'd like to thank the museum for having us. This is a, an honor for us to be here. It's an amazing institution, an amazing place to come and see glass being made. And for people outside of this area, it's an amazing place to come and, and work with a world-class team and world-class facilities. So it's, it really is a, it's an honor for us. So thank the museum and thank you guys. Ready? Somebody did not validate their parking. No? OK. Um, OK, so like I said, I'm Adam Holtzinger, uh, Susan Speranovich. We uh, currently live in Brooklyn, New York, uh, and started my glassmaking career, I guess you could say, at the Cleveland Institute of Art in Ohio. Um, this is the picture of the building. I was actually a photography major. And I was, that's what I planned on doing. And I was stuck around one summer to give tours for the school. I didn't want to go to my parents' house. So I was giving tours at the school. And I had to go through the entire, all the facilities. And I came across the glass, make glass program. And I had absolutely no idea what I was stepping into. I'd never seen glass making before. So I was blown away about it with seeing that. And I decided to sell all my cameras and start blowing glass. And so. a side note to that, um, so I went to school with Adam. I studied graphic design. And when Adam came to tell me that he was switching to glass, my reaction was, how are you going to make money? <laughs> um, and here we are today. So I got sucked in as well. Yeah. So some real quick, we'll just go through. This is um, my thesis show. So after five years of making glass, I was very, very interested in Italian <coughs> techniques and forms. Um, these three pieces in the middle there are uh, 
glued together in separate parts, and the largest one is five and a half feet tall. Um, yeah, studies of stuff. This one I coated in silicone rubber, so you could actually squeeze it and get close to it and touch it. The idea was that I get to touch the material all the time, and it's really great, so why can the viewer not be able to touch it? So that was the thought process on that. This next piece was glued together in, I think, 30-something different sections. Um, you could spin it around. There's Lazy Susans um, embedded in there, glued in there, so you can spin the whole thing, and it would rock back and forth, and it was really dangerous. Uh, normal, normal goblet size piece of glass. Um, Next, we we can do this together. This part, yeah, keep going. okay. <laughs> I'm doing all right. So in 2003, we decided to both of us decided to move to Brooklyn, New York. Um, I immediately went to Urban Glass, which is a public access studio in in Brooklyn. It's been around since the 70s, and I've been there. We've been there ever since. Um, kind of cut my teeth working there, uh, making all kinds of different lighting and sculptural objects for people. Not really too much art making, but mostly design-oriented objects for restaurants and private collections, yada, yada. Um, 2005, I st started making some of my own vessels. Uh, these ideas of, uh, idea of lidded, lidded vessels uh, that I would cover with vinyl stencils and sandblast away. Um, refining that lidded, lidded vessel idea. Multiple colors, varying in scale. This one is probably 28 inches tall or so. Um, okay, your turn. <laughs> um, so I'd been watching Adam make glass in school and through his career as a fabricator of lighting and objects. And uh, eventually I got sucked in and we started to collaborate. And that collaboration turned into us founding our brand, which is Keep. Uh, the importance for us is about making objects that people will keep and pass down for generations but also keeping the tradition of handmade glass alive. And uh, these Italian techniques that have been shared with us, it's important for us to share that knowledge and move it forward, uh, utilizing them in a contemporary way. So uh, we create lighting and objects, and this is the Kane series. Do you want to talk about process? Sure. The, the process of this, for those of you who don't know, is we pull long threads of glass, um, in this case black glass, uh, black solid color glass with clear glass over it. We then put those threads of glass onto a ceramic shelf and roll those threads up as a sheet. and. Then once everything is formed together, we manipulate the pattern and then blow the object up into its final form. So it's a very time consuming technique, but the idea for us is to have this inside and outside look, so the pattern in the front and how it reacts with the pattern in the back. Um, so again, this is just a little bit of process. So this is us pulling the cane, chopping the cold pieces of glass up. Um, here it's the ceramic shelf that we're going to melt that together as a sheet. And then the bubbles rolled across it. And then the object is shaped. Uh, in this case, it was twisted very, very tight to get a nice pattern that way. I know, it's a really handsome guy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> OK, your turn. Uh, the, uh, another series that we have is we call these the poke pendants, um, derived or influenced by uh, 1960s um, uh, uh, Tapio Vercola uh, designer. Um, this idea of a poke that's going into the, the glass itself, and these sort of just add a pop of color to uh, any, any sort of room. Uh, next series, uh, our first tabletop is a play on that first, the, the Kane series lights, where um, we can get a really beautiful pattern by 
imploding one section of that sphere to make a bowl, and then the pattern crisscrosses over itself. So again, another play of inside and outside, trying to create a moray pattern. So a big part of our practice is not just making our own objects to sell. Uh, we also work with other designers, architects, and artists, um, both in terms of fabrication and collaboration. Uh, and it's important for us because it's super rewarding. Um, we get to try new things and learn together and sort of push the boundary of the material. Rather than being insular and sort of re repeating the things we know, uh, working with people who aren't informed uh, about glass and using the material really gets us to think differently about it. So these are some of uh, the collaborations we've done over the past. So this first one was a collaboration with um, ourselves, uh, Mark Thorpe and Luca Nacchetto. Uh Luca Nacchetto is a Murnese-based designer. Um, Mark Thorpe is a New York, Brooklyn-based designer. Um, and we all got together, decided to do this project, invited a bunch of architects and designers from New York City to come, and we created this object on the fly, and we made made the object on the fly, designed it, and fabricated it within um, an hour and a half or so. Yeah. And this was um, displayed at? Uh, at Wanted Design during New York Design Week. Yep. Uh, we then had the opportunity from that relationship to travel to Murano and to get tours of all the different factories. And we had the honor of being able to go to Vanini, actually get on the, the blowing floor which, if you don't know, it's incredibly difficult to do, sometimes near impossible. Um, and they let me make glass there. So this is this has sort of been a highlight of everything so far. So that was that was really fun. It was really great time. Um, they let me make a piece, and we actually forced them to sign <laughs> sign my name, Vanini, one of one. So that's kind of, I have a Vanini now. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Uh, so shortly after our trip to Murano, COVID hit, and we were stuck indoors for three months with no hot shop, and thought, what could we do to be creative and make glass virtually uh, to keep our minds busy? And so we, we designed this set um, with a peer of ours, Anders uh, Rydstedt, and it was something that we did over Zoom and talked about and came up with this concept of what we call couples. And it was something that we did, uh, we took orders on and we knew that we would have something to do uh, when we could resume making glass. So uh, the concept was we can gather again and have a drink and sort of celebrate being, to you know, being able to gather again. Uh, just some, some quick tabletop fabrication things. Um, yeah, they're, I don't know what to say about these. <laughs> uh, we also, yeah, so tabletop objects are, are big for us. We, we do a lot of it. Um, it's also really fun. It's a really good skill building exercise as well. Um, so these are all works for other designers uh, in New York. Uh, so they'll come to us with drawings, and then we have to figure out how to make them, and then how to make them replicable. So again, this is, this is not our personal work. These are objects that we fabricate. Um, so this is someone that we work with, uh, Sophie Lou Jacobson. And for the past couple days, Sophie was actually here and joined us here. And we collaborated on a small project together during this residency. So um, again, this is the sharing of, of our minds, really. And our enjoyment was working with, with her and, and coming up with new ideas and collaborating and, and doing these things has really been fruitful for us. Some lighting fabrication. Yeah, we're gonna 
go all the way back in time, a couple years. Um, back in 2003, when we first moved to New York City, I got involved with a company called Niche Modern, and I ended up prototyping and fabricating their lighting for about 13 years. So this was, again, an, another way that I cut my teeth in, in running production, which I think is really, really important for um, glass makers to actually gain, gain some skill. So uh, I also did prototyping and fabrication for Lindsay Edelman, uh, New York-based lighting designer. So as you can see, it's not very traditional shape making things. They're a little bit, a little bit funky. So it's really, really fun to not always have to work in, in the round, I guess. Another client of ours is um, Avram Russo Studios. And this is a current client. And it, again, lighting. So fabricating these rather large scale objects. Uh, this is Anna Carlin, another New York-based artist or uh, uh, designer. This is for Matter, uh, private collection. Uh, this is a company called uh, In Common With, and we are working closely with them for the last few years, making their objects, uh, lighting pieces and sculptural lighting pieces. This is also in common with, but it's a collaboration with Sophie Lou Jacobson. So it's kind of neat that we had these two different clients who didn't know one another, didn't know that they were working with the same glass makers, and then came, came to us separately and said, oh, we're going to do this collaboration. And then it was like, oh, it was one big happy family working together, um, which I think was a nice sort of collaboration. Yeah, and it became, it became really quick. Everything came together quickly because we, we knew each other's aesthetic already and, and way of working. So a lot of work could get produced in a very short amount of time. So it's really great. This is, this is the type of collaboration that we really, really enjoy. Uh, these next two pieces are just examples of other lighting pieces in public spaces. Ooh, my favorite. Um, we were asked to do a, uh, a nine chandelier installation. Um, this is actually directly across from Urban Glass, where we, the studio that we work at. Um, it's called Gotham Market. And it's a huge market. These, we, had, we were contracted to make 200 uh, spheres, um, close to the uh, design of ours. And um, so we took the job, and we had a really good time doing it. And right in the middle of this, project there was we looked at each other and we said there's something that we needed to do this month I can't remember what it was it's like oh we need to get married so we we stopped production for a day and went and got married and continued production the next day so these pieces are thanks <laughs> these are these are special for for us because we when we go to work every day we look across the street and we see our first big project that we did together and this is, I don't know, it's special for us. Uh, this is the most recent project we did with Stephen Hall Architects and um, this was sort of interesting because, let me go back, uh, they presented us with these drawings and these renders and had an idea of what they wanted the glass to be and uh, physically and functionally it wasn't going to work. Um, so we proposed something else, and they were open to it. And um, what's, what's cool about working with them is uh, one of the, the lead architect on the project had also taken glass blowing classes and was familiar with the material. And so he understood what needed to happen for the production and the mold making part of the process. So the architect actually did some of the small scale prototyping, built the molds, and then we made 
the large-scale prototypes in production uh, for this installation that's in Princeton. So they're really beautiful um, objects and really showing you know, the seams and the grain of the wood of the molds. It was about the materiality uh, showing through. Art fabrication. So we also do uh, fabrication for artists uh, as well, mostly New York City-based artists currently. Um, this is Martha Friedman. Um, these were really large hot blow mold pieces um, of fingers. Uh, the one on the right is covered in 24 karat gold. So this was a super fun project. Um, it's nice to work with artists because it's not it's not so spec oriented, you know? We don't have to have these tolerances. It's a little bit more free form. So it, it does, I don't know, gives us a little bit of break from making super tight glass into being a little bit more free form. But the collaboration is, is also the same. There's a really great collaboration that happens between the artists themselves and the, the fabricators. This is artist Mika Tajima. Um, this, these are some of our favorite days because Mika will come in with drawings that we don't quite understand what they're going to be, but she's so informed in the process that it's like what the blown objects look like at, when we're done making them, the final product is completely different because then they get, you know, drilled and cut and polished and sort of presented in a completely different way. Um, from what we understand, so it's um, yeah, it's sort of like story. Christmas when we get to see the finished product. It's <laughs> we don't know what it's going to look like, and then when we see them fully finished, it's another whole other thing. So it's really great. We also make glass for artist Annika Yi. Oh, I thought I had more than that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, teaching and demonstrate. Uh, you guys can read. I don't know why I'm reading that. Jeez, sorry. <laughs> Uh, like Susan said before, uh, teaching is a really big part of our business and, and the way that we actually live as well and, and ap approach our business and our, and our lives is to share this, this knowledge that's been passed down to us and to make sure that it keeps going and to make sure that other people know about it and to, to give everything that we have so that it can continue on. Uh, this is Pilchuck Glass School. This is right up the road-ish. Um, this is Penland School of Craft. This is in uh, Penland, North Carolina. Uh, we also work with Corning Museum of Glass and their Glass Lab, uh, which is a traveling mobile hot shop where they park it in different places around the world and we invite students and artists to come in and we make glass for them, sort of like what's happening at this museum. Uh, this was in New York City. So this was on Governor's Island and this was pretty interesting because the um, designers who were invited were graphic designers, so not product designers, um, knew nothing about making glass, came with drawings, and that was in conjunction with the Cooper Hewitt Museum. We also had the opportunity to travel to uh, Paris with, with Corning, and we were right in front of the Louvre, and artists and designers from, from Paris. We got to work with some students from the, from the school who had never seen glass before, so they got to use glass. It's really, really exciting. Uh, this is fairly recently. We traveled to Aalto University in uh, Finland, uh, outside of Helsinki, Finland. And we did a lecture and demonstration there. We also went to the Nutarvi village of glass, which is a couple hours north of Helsinki. And it's a glass blowing village. So we got to work in an in a old factory and, and work with some students that are in the program there. Uh, we also went to, with a friend of ours, Mark Bereda, we went to the Royal, oh, you're better at this. It's a Royal Glass Factory. It's in Spain, um, La Granja. It's actually near Segovia. Uh, there's this amazing, I think it's what, 250,000 square foot glass factory 
uh, that's been there since the Se 1700s. 1700s, yeah. Um, and they're still making uh, stemware production there. And they have a small school. And uh, it's this beautiful little village in the mountains. Uh, and everybody works for the, the glass factory. So we were invited and asked to make things in the Italian style, but inspired by the village. And so these were the pieces that we made during our week there um, that will be in the permanent collection of their museum. And then sort of riffing off that, we were then invited to Schloss Holleneg Castle. Um, just so happened there was a design exhibition for that week and they wanted to have live glass blowing during the exhibition. So the, the exhibit was um, all glass made by or designed by various designers throughout Europe. So the same friend, Mark Barreto, drove his mobile hot shop down from Amsterdam and we made glass in the courtyard of the castle for a week. Not terrible. <laughs> kind of nice. That's it. So that is it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? All right. Sure. <laughs> question is, what is it like to shift between working with clients, fabricating for clients versus like collaborating with one another? Um, I feel like in this particular scenario, what's that? I think it went well this week. I think this, this particular scenario, it was almost as if I were the client, but with knowledge of what he can do and what the team can do and what's possible. Um, I feel like we sort of work that way together anyhow, um, even with clients back in New York, um, having these types of conversations and working through, I don't know, problem solving. Yeah, I mean, it's, it didn't feel any different than our day to day, um, but it was. We're still trying to process that information, I think. I mean, overall, it was really successful. I think it was super successful. Um, I think we were able to work through a lot of designs quickly because we speak the same language, um, but also it felt so short and quick that it's like I had to, we had to think so quickly for the next thing. So like shorter time to process what the next thing was gonna be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we would do it again, five stars. <laughs> yes. All the time. <laughs> Since we're live streaming, no. <laughs> they're all amazing. <laughs> yes, there, there are clients that are more difficult than others, for sure. That happens. Um, but so it's subjective. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't call it difficult. Meaning working with other glass blowers? Hmm. Like with we help out other people? Yeah. Uh, the question is, what is it like working with other glass blowers? Um, uh, it's great. It's it's really fun. Um, for example, this team here, exceptional glass makers, uh, we all speak the same language. So it's very, very easy. And even, even when there is a language barrier, um, we can easily go into the shop and there's no, yeah, there's no barrier. We, 
we work together, we know exactly what we want to happen and the process is the same no matter what. So it's really creative things can happen when we work with other glass makers. It's some of our favorite things to do, yeah. So for our production line, uh, the small table objects start at around 700 retail and the lighting goes up to around 3,500 retail. And then custom commissions will range depending on what they are. Yeah. Well. I would say our dream collaboration is something that we're sort of working towards, which is um, building our own studio together. Um, so doing that with the help of friends in the community, um, and not just a studio for ourselves, but a place where artists and designers can come for residencies and also have a educational aspect of taking apprentices and sort of sharing the craft with people in the community. So that's, it's not an object, but it's more of a, uh, that's know, our physical, you know, place. Yeah, that's our next, that's our next goal that we're going for currently. So it's a long term. Thank Thanks. you. That's a great question. When, when was the last time we were surprised about w while making something? Every time. <laughs> <laughs> I get. I understand. I understand the question. Yeah. No. It's. I think as a as a craftsperson, you. Um, after so many hours of of working in your craft, things become less and less unpredictable. That's when. I personally believe that limits should start to be pushed. And then we have this sort of unpredicted results, maybe. Um, so those, when you're beginning, those unexpected things are kind of a bad thing. And then the more you work with a material, those, those unexpected things become a joy because you learn from them, you know. But yeah, every time, there's always something weird going on, yeah. Thank you again, thanks for coming out. Thank you guys so much, um, and we really appreciate all of you that are here today. Uh, we're gonna take a quick lunch break and be back around two o'clock for the final chapter of this amazing residency. Thank you both for everything you've given the Thank museum you. this week.
Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Museum of Glass. Today, we have two guest artists, Adam Holzinger and Susan Spir Spiranovich. Spiranovich. Uh, they work together. They have a glass company called Keep in Brooklyn, and they do a lot of uh, glass fabrication for lighting, for architects, for designers, and even for artists. So there are guest artists for this week. They're working with our Museum of Glass Hot Shop team. We have a regular team of glass blowers that works for the museum. So our guys will be assisting, and they'll be leading the team. So that's Adam sitting at the workbench. And just let me get you started. I'm going to just give you just a very brief introduction to how glass blowing works. Everything that we do starts out in our glass furnaces. The glass furnaces are the machines where you see the doors closed. There's two of them, one on each side of the studio. If you look up on the big screen, you'll see a diagram. That's what they look like inside. So each one of them has a big ceramic pot. In that ceramic pot is 1,000 pounds of melted glass. We keep the melted glass at 2,140 degrees. And at that temperature, the glass has the consistency of honey. So if you can imagine a giant crock pot full of honey, that's what our furnace is like. We want to get the glass out to make stuff. We take one of those steel pipes, and we dip it into the melted glass like you're dipping into a big jar of honey. We dip it in, twirl it around, a little bit of glass sticks to the end of the pipe. The pipe itself is hollow, so when you blow, the ball of glass blows up like a balloon. Once you get the glass out of the furnace, it only stays soft for a little while. So we do whatever shaping or blowing we can while it's still soft. When it cools and starts to get hard, we go to the second type of furnace, and that's called the glory hole. The glory holes have no glass in them. They're just a hot chamber for heating and softening the glass while we're working. So we heat it up, make it soft, go to the workbench, shape it a little, starts to get stiff, back to the glory hole and heat it up again. If you've ever seen anybody work at a forge making horseshoes or swords, they take the metal, put it in the fire, soften it, work on it a little bit, back in the fire, soften it again. Same routine you're gonna see here. All glass, when it's very hot, looks orange. The orange color that you're seeing is the glow from the heat, not the color of the glass. So the glass we're working with today is all clear glass but when it's hot, it looks like that orange ball at the end of his pipe. Sometimes these steel pipes get hot. When they do, we take them over to that trough. That's called the pipe cooler. We spray water on the metal pipe. That cools it down and makes it easier to hold. So now Adam's going to shape the glass. Oops. He sees something in there he doesn't want. At this point, when the glass is thick and gooey, if it's a little bubble or something, we can pick it out and cut it off. So now he's going to shape it with a tool called the block. The tool is made out of wood. It's stored in a bucket of water. As long as the wood is wet, the tool doesn't burn, and it doesn't leave any marks as he shapes the glass. So the piece we're going to be making is the piece drawn on that blackboard. And we made the foot earlier, just before lunch. It's sitting in that silver oven, staying warm. Now we're making the bowl. Oh, we also, this morning, we made these handles. 
They were also in the garage. So we got a little head start on this. The garage is an oven as well. It operates at half the temperature of the furnaces. It's hot enough to keep the glass from breaking, but it's not hot enough to make it soft. So whatever goes in there stays warm, holds its shape. When we're ready to use it, we'll pull it out, heat it up a little extra. Does anybody have any questions so far? The garage is the silver oven with the curved side behind the blackboard. Notice that one of the glass blowers will be seated to the left of the workbench. He'll be the guy that's blowing. He'll blow through the steel tube, the blowpipe, and inflate the glass while Adam sitting at the bench shapes it. Now he's squeezing the glass with a tool called the jacks. He's making a notch in it. That notch is the place we'll break, be able to break the glass away from the pipe once we're done shaping. So what to be the top of the bowl is stuck to the pipe. The bottom is the part that's sticking out. How are you guys? Good. Do you guys have any questions? It's just plain room temperature water, just like in your faucet. If it's too hot, we turn it down. If it's too cold, we turn it up.
dark gray pad in Adam's hand that he's shaping the glass with is just folded up ordinary newspaper soaked in water. As long as the newspaper is wet, the paper doesn't burn too much, and it doesn't leave any marks as he shapes the glass. Can we put up the newspaper photo? So if you look up on the big screen, it's just regular, everyday newspaper. We're going to drop a little glass onto the bottom. Adam will sit down and shape it up. So he's making the little post that separates the foot from the bowl. glass and then we coat it with the color whatever color you want. Can we do that uh, you said back in the drilling hole? No. Nope. Well yeah sort of. Not that we we cut off a chunk and we put it on the end of one of those steel pipes. Have any questions? How frequently are there accidents or burns? Uh, hardly any accidents. Uh, we get little burns like you might if you, you worked in a kitchen. So little annoying things, not medical things. One of our glass blowers was asked how often he gets burned, and his reply was, only on payday. You guys have any questions?
To the second bubble we added is going to become the foot, the base. We cut it off in a big teardrop shape. We're going to cut that teardrop in half. We're going to butt off that pointy part. And then we'll spread that out, and that'll be the foot. Yes? When do people use didymium lenses? When you're working with uh, when you're working with flame working, where you have and borosilicate glass, and you have a very high, you get the glass very very hot, and it gives off a flare called sodium flare, and the didymium is uh, formulated to cut that out. We don't get that here because we're not getting the glass as hot. But scientific glass workers, flame workers who make stuff over a table torch, they, they have that uh, issue. Bust off that end. And that leaves us with a sphere with a little hole in the end. We're going to spread that out to make the foot. We're going to trim a little bit of that glass off the bottom. When the glass is hot, you can cut it with a pair of shears. So now Adam is pushing against the inside of that opening to make it wider. Uh, the clear scra scraps can be recycled. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. 
we have to bust them up, wash them, and then they go in with the new raw ingredients, a certain percentage, we put a certain percentage old glass, a certain percentage new glass. The next part of this process is to transfer the glass from the rod it's on now, the blowpipe, to a second steel rod called the punty. The second steel rod will hold it from the bottom while we shape the top. Gabe, the man in the black hat, is preparing the punty. He's coated a metal rod with some molten glass. That'll make it sticky on the tip. We'll stick it on to the bottom, and then we'll break the glass away from the pipe it's on now. gas and air into the chamber and then the same volume that it has to leave. So uh, the gases that come out are like the 2,000 degrees. So you, a lot of heat just goes up the chimney, out the flue. But electric, you can button it up because you're not pumping any gas in there. You can contain the whole thing. Can we put up how how hot is it? So just to give you an idea of the different temperatures, the temperatures on the slide in orange are the centigrade temperatures. The ones in white are Fahrenheit.
You're going to take the shears and trim off some of the thick glass at the top. We put up some of our guest artists' uh, artwork up on the big screen. These are some lights uh, fabricated by our, our guest artists. So they work with architects, interior decorators, and designers to make custom glass for lighting. They also make uh, tableware as well. These are their... This is a large project that they did. These are some of their drawings for the artwork that they want to make while they're here. We have two ways in which we heat up the glass. Sometimes we heat it up in the glory hole, the big round oven. Sometimes we heat it up with a torch. When we heat it up with the torches, we can focus the heat in a particular place. When we heat it up in the big round oven, the glory hole, it heats it up more generally. The torches allow us to direct the heat just exactly where we want it. Has anybody got any questions? Yes. What is a black paddles? Those are made out of wood. Those are just, they're black because they're charred from contact with the glass. So they're burnt on the outside. But they're just plain old wood. To shape it to a certain extent, we use things like flattening the bottom of a vase so it sits nicely on the table. We also use them to shield the glass blower's arm from the heat. The heat that comes off the glass is radiant heat like an outdoor heater. It heats the first thing it strikes. So if you put the paddle between the arm and the glass, the paddle gets hot, the arm does.
making. Um, a Christmas ornament takes about three minutes. A wine glass probably takes 20. Vases are probably 45 minutes. Start with skinny little rods of colored glass, and they melt them together, pinch them, shape them, and they put clear glass around them. are from New York, so we have sketch artists from Sweden, Italy, France, Spain, all over the world. Uh, it's not as much as you would think. Gabe is holding the two paddles parallel to keep that thing straight. We have the bowl. We have the stripe in the middle. We have the foot. And once you get the bowl to just the shape that they want it, then we'll start to add the handles. Now Adam's pressing on the inside of the glass to make that lower, wider, and flatter.
So we're getting ready to attach the handles. We made them earlier in the day. They're sitting inside the garage. These are the handles. You guys have any questions? Good. Good. We have to be very careful when we're heating this up because the little handles are quite thin, so they heat up quicker. And, and so they'll get hot before the rest of the bowl gets hot. So if we don't want to bend them, we have to heat everything up very carefully. Sarah comes over with a tray of handles that we made this morning. We heat the edges up and adhere it to the side of the bowl. Hot glass sticks to hot glass.
And we're heating up the tips of the little handle. The torch is a propane and oxygen torch. You get it very hot and soft. You can stick it on to the side of the bowl. So we're almost done, and the reason I know that is I look at Sarah. She's put on some protective clothing. She's going to carry the finished bowl to our annealing oven to cool slowly overnight. Everything that we make has to be cooled slowly so it doesn't break. The slow cooling process is called annealing. How are you guys? Good. Do you guys have any questions? 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 200 degrees hotter than the hottest volcano.
brought up to the chief. Are we doing this for a parent? For the badge? Can you is it using their company badge or can you, uh, you can glue it, but you if you usually you can't glue it in a way that distracts it. So here we go. We'll drip a little water on the joint between the metal rod and the bowl itself. The water will crack that joint. And with a light tap, off it will come. That'll go into our annealer, where it'll be cooled overnight. Anybody have any questions? Anything you've always wanted to know about glass but were afraid to ask? One of our favorite things to do here at the museum, we have a contest for kids. Any kid 12 and under that comes to the museum can do a drawing. Once a month, we pick one of the drawings and we make whatever the kid drew out of glass. We make two copies, one for the kid to keep and one for the museum collection. If we have a little video, show you what we've done with some of the kids. Can we play kids design?
baby monster. Pip is a baby monster that loves to smile and laugh. Even though he's little and cute, he gives a big cry. Also, Pip loves food, especially bananas. He will eat any speck of food in sight. And especially if the um, pieces of art go traveling around, other kids will see, oh my gosh, I could do that too. You know, it's not just somebody else that, you know, it's they did it, you know, it, I couldn't do that. Absolutely not. Anyone can do this. It's, and I think that's what it shows the kids. Maybe not everybody can win. But, <laughs> and that, and I think it's going to be, it's going to stand up there with one of the coolest things that, that a museum has ever done. What is it, a, a, cucum, a cucumber all dressed up for a night on the town? I, that's, that's pretty ridiculously funny. The funnest part about this project is how fresh the ideas are coming from the kids who, they, they have no idea of glass blowing techniques, they don't care. Nobody saw this coming. We'd make one piece and it was given to the family. And then we realized, well, wait a second, there's something more here. We started to get more drawings, more interesting drawings, and it really kind of snowballed a little bit. Bacon Boy was special. shows that you know there's an artist in, in all of us I think so and it's a uh, it's human nature to be creative and so I think we lose that as we get older sometimes and it's cool to see this pure um, creative nature that that children possess so I think it's cool to, to share that with the rest of the world hopefully so. Thank you for supporting Kids Design Glass. <laughs> some decorations on the side of the next piece. We want to have a rib texture on these decorations. So we're trying a new different mold to give us the rib texture.
So in order to get the rib texture, we use a mold called the optic mold. Can we put up the optic mold drawing? So if you look on the big screen, it's a metal mold. It has grooved ribs on the inside. We stuff the glass into the mold. We come out, it gives a ribs texture to the surface. Different shapes and sizes and numbers of ribs give you a different look. So we're trying a different mold. We're going to see if they like the look. So over on your right, Sarah in the black shirt and shorts is starting the bubble for the next piece. Stretch the glass out so it's both skinny. Yeah. You double it over, and then you take a pair of shears and crimp it around a, uh, a, a metal rod. So you take it like that. There's a metal rod, you go like that, and then you take the shears and squeeze it and cut it off. And then when 
I'm going to tell you. Just a little bit of a story. So when we first moved to Seoul, and we moved our first our class, it was a little coach. We took it off, and first thing we did was grab the wings, just drop it over the hot glass, and curl it into that. Oh, wow. So the, the idea is that uh, the hot glass was 
So we're making a variation on this piece over here. So it's going to be similar. It's going to be more of a sphere instead of flattened. And it's going to have uh, similar decorations, except they'll be ribbed glass instead of smooth. Hi. How are you guys? Good. Do you guys have any questions? We have a, two guest artists, Susan Sp Spiradovich and uh, I'm getting sleepy here. And uh, in a blank. Adam Helsinger. And so they're our guest artists for the week. And so we're helping them make their designs. So these are all their designs. They're all new designs. They're trying out new stuff. They take them home. They can do anything they want with them. Give them to mom. Sell them to a millionaire. Put it in a, a recycling bin. No, but I meant like um, when I'm out in the street or I'm out in the community, when I'm working on these first things, I try to get the glass as more textured and more bubble
stretching out the glass at the very top. Squeeze that opening and make a little flange. So we're going to bust off that little flange. Now we're going to start adding the decorations. So the one we're making here is a variation on this. Instead of having a flat section, we're going to have a whole sphere. And we're going to make these same kind of curly cue decorations, except they'll be ribbed instead of smooth.
We're almost done. Everything that we make has to be cooled slowly or it'll break. The slow cooling process is called annealing. We'll take the sculpture off the metal rod. We'll place it in an oven called the annealer where it'll be cooled very slowly overnight. If we just put it on the table and let it cool on its own, it would cool too quickly and unevenly, and it would break. Take a pair of tweezers, dip them in water, drip a few drops of water on the joint between the sculpture and the metal rod. The water will crack that joint. And a little tap will release it.
So over on the right, Gabe starting the bubble for the next piece. Gabe is a man of the black hat. He's dipped that steel pipe, the blowpipe, into the molten glass. He blows through that tube, and a little bubble pops out. Gabe's going back to our furnace. He's going to get more molten glass. Behind that door, there's a big ceramic tank. In that ceramic tank is 1,000 pounds of melted glass. The glass that we're working with is clear glass. The orange color that you're seeing is the glow from the heat. So now in the center, Adam is shaping the glass using a tool called the block. The tool is made out of wood, it's kept wet. As long as it's wet, the tool doesn't burn and it doesn't leave any marks on the glass. One of the glass blowers is seated to the left of the workbench. He's the guy who's be blowing. He'll blow through that steel tube and inflate the glass on the other end.
Last is made out of three things. Sand, soda ash, and lime. Mostly melted sand. The soda ash, the sodium carbonate, which is a chemical, lowers the melting temperature of the sand. The lime is calcium carbonate, and that stabilizes the mixture. So, what, what they were wondering was, if you go to the beach, there's a bunch of sand that looks like crushed up shells and stuff too, depending on like what kind of beach you're on. Yes. So where do you, like how pure is the sand? Well, sand mines, there are actually places where it's mined. In North Carolina, there's some, uh, you know, some crap in there. You just block it. Put it on the, on the screen. Hold it down. So it's a big thing. try to melt the quartz just by itself, you'd have to get the oven up to 3,000 degrees. Yeah, and then you, so um, we have the soda ash, which is sodium, uh, sodium uh, carbonate, and that acts as a flux, and that lowers the melting temperature of the sand down to about 22, 24 hours. That was the key of these things. So what's the difference between the glass you're working with here and crystal? Like crystal is a type of glass. They're both glass. Crystal is a type of glass. It's a glass which has between 25 and 35 percent lead in it. The lead makes the glass softer so that it's easy to cut and polish. It also makes it denser so that it bends light more and it's a little more sparkly than regular copper. And somehow the lead is just looser once you melt it. So that's the thing. Pretty cool. The crystal is something that sort of people in the retail trade value, but glass blowers. Yeah. Now it's just like chocolate or vanilla. Some people like chocolate, they like vanilla. Uh, but the retailers, they surround it with a mystery for a glass of glass. And it's like, yeah. and when you make colored glass, what is the secret that you Most of the colors are metal dissolved in the glass, and you first pick it up from scratch. So if you take that sand, soda, and lime, and you pick it up with cobalt, you get blue. Chromium green. Green white. A little bit of gold red. Not everything that colors glass is a metal, but most of the colors are metal. What? It's all blown down. Homemade fresh from the oven. Right here, right here, right now. Here we go. Maybe we either bought one or sold one. <laughs> I have no idea. How long have you been working here? Two, three years on and off. You make your own stuff. Yeah, I have a whole separate one. Making one of these designs, this little bowl with a kind of big leaky handle. Is there that? Nope, there's no crystal example of that. It's just a different thing. What are they um, cleaning the glass? Cleaning the glass. Cleaning the glass. That big round oven? Yeah. That's called the glory hole. Can we put up the glory hole diagram? You have to ask your dad about that. So that's just a, 
a brick barrel with a gas burner in the side. We stick the glass in there for a minute. It gets hot. It gets soft. And then we bring it back to the workbench, and we can shape it. Natural gas and forced air. So the pressurized air blows into the gas flame to make it hotter. It's a different kind of brick. It's called fire brick. It's the kind of bricks you have in a pottery kiln. Not, 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 exact, not the same, but similar to the bricks in a house. They're just fired at a higher temperature, so they resist the heat more. So now we're going to try our big angle looping handle. We've never actually done this before. So if it doesn't go well, we're blaming you. Him. We want to put a big looping handle around the bowl. 
that at an angle. Here we go. I think you're okay. No glory hole for you today. Uh, no glory hole for you today.
I don't think we got exactly what we were expecting. Let's see if we can make the most of it. Not glass artists, then uh, our crack team, uh, will, they will uh, artists design something, and our team will do a house on it. So if it's a, a basket maker or a poet or a ceramicist, we'll make that thing design it. So glass makers are the planet. They can take the stuff, and we make stuff, we can work with glass blower.
Thanks for coming in.